Good morning and welcome to our live coverage of Loeb Observatory of the November 8th solar eclipse. It's a great day, day today because we, we've got um, eclipse coverage for the next three hours. Plus when we're done, then we can go vote. Um, so this is, a, this is such a big day. It's gonna be a long day for a lot of people um, between doing this moon stuff and, and, and the election. Um, Joy, my name is Kevin Schindler. I'm a historian and public information officer at Lowell Observatory. And I'm joined by the incomparable John Compton, geologist, educator, and why don't you introduce yourself? What up, nerds? It's me, John. <laughs> um, you know, I do all kinds of things up here on the hill. Uh, John, how long have you been working here? I think like six years, maybe? Six years. Like that. Yeah, people stay here for, for a long time. So John was just getting started in some ways, but he's got such a great background in moon studies um, and science and education. So for the next three hours, uh, we're gonna be hosting this program and talking about um, the eclipse. Um, some of these terms that you hear, the penumbral, penumbral, what all that stuff means. I uh, will talk about Flagstaff's long heritage connected to the moon, um, moon studies, um, astronaut training that's still going on today in preparation for the next crewed missions to the moon. Um, and then we're just going to take some really cool looks at the moon because the weather yeah. looks great right now. I'm just looking at our feed. Yeah, yeah the moon looks great. And and John, we've just started. I see it right up there. Yeah. Yes, it's back back there. I know we need to be doing this outside. So we we're we're now the, the partial eclipse has started. Yeah. But there's there's different phases of the eclipse. Mm -hmm. There's penumbral. There's numbral. There's total. Let's talk about that a little bit. What all that means. So you yeah. know. Um, and we, we do have plenty of fun videos that we're going to go into that might answer some of these these things as well. But hopefully we'll clear up any confusion and, uh, you know, maybe maybe throw some shade your way. Um, so the, uh, you know, the eclipse is caused right now by um, Earth's shadow, um, basically uh, casting a shadow on the moon. Right. So the sun's sun's behind us <clears throat> and the shadow of the Earth is kind of making like. Um, shadow puppets on the moon, realistically, but it can only do one, and it's a big circle. Um, so, uh, umbral and penumbral are the terms for when we're partially covered and fully covered. So, penumbral means we're partially covered. Umbral, like the 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 umbra, right, is the um, fully sort of covered area when when we're fully covered by the shadow. Um, and uh, because I'm a I'm a word nerd. Um, so like uh, pen umbra, um, pen just means almost. So like penultimate and um, penitent and things like that. Um, and then umbra literally means shade. So like when you talk about like um, having umbrage with with something, you mean you literally mean throwing shade. Um, and like it's where we get um, umbrella. So uh, the pen umbra is the almost shade, and then the umbra is the, the shade, which I think is fun. And then if, if everything is right, mm -hmm. then we have totality. Yeah. And, and in a little bit, we're gonna hear from Rezi Balco, who's gonna um, talk about what a lunar eclipse is, but we thought we'd introduce a few terms right now, yeah. just to kind of get the feel for it. And, and this is how it's gonna go for the next three hours. We're gonna keep sharing live views of the moon. We're gonna hear from a bunch of our educators about different aspects of the moon, um, the eclipse, what it means, uh, and also look to the future of exploration. We, we know about, or most of us probably are familiar with the astronauts who walked on the moon and explored the moon 50 years ago. In fact, the last crewed mission to the moon um, was 50 years ago um, in December. And so, the, you know, that seems a life, life, like a lifetime ago. If you were living back in the 1960s, it had been 50 years since World War I. And that was ancient history to a lot of people, especially kids. So, you know, for younger generations now, Apollo program is ancient history, yeah. um, but we're we're doing it again. And Flagstaff plays such a big role um, with with geologists like Jim Skinner and and Lauren Edgar helping train the astronauts. And in fact, NASA was just in town a couple weeks ago. So we're going to talk about all that stuff, um, share um, several videos. We're also going to be answering questions as we go along, and um, we'll try to get to them either at an appropriate time um, or somewhere along the feed. Um, so we'll try to get it to as many of those as we can. Um, in fact, we have yeah. um, a couple right now we can get started and we'll probably be answering these similar questions throughout, but we also expect our viewership to change as, um, well, we're gonna stay up the whole time, not yeah. everybody else necessarily will. <laughs> so let's, um, 
let's start with the first question. Um, can you explain the why and how of when we see your, uh, let me try that again in English. Um, why do we see a red moon? Why is it pure red color? Yeah. So um, I, I, I do believe our, our first video is gonna go into this in more detail. So I'll give you like a teaser trailer version. Um, sunsets. Okay. No. Um, so uh, it's um, basically the only light that's hitting the moon from the sun is going through Earth's atmosphere. And so um, it's going, you know, the, the light's going basically around the Earth and hitting the moon and illuminating it, right? There's nothing, there's no like backsplash to, to illuminate it. It's just our sun. And our sun shines light and some of it makes it around the Earth. Um, and the same reason that a sunset looks red, right? When the light passes through the atmosphere, you know, it gets refracted. Um, you get Rayleigh scattering. I'm sure we'll go into more detail in the video. Um, but then, so the only light that's hitting the moon is sunset light. So it looks red. And we'll, and we'll hear more about that when Rezi um, gets her uh, video. And again, we'll have videos throughout the evening. I um, mean, we're going to hear from Rezi in a, about 10 minutes or so, but maybe John, since we'll be here for the next three hours, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, our backgrounds. Um, sure. What's your background and what's your, especially really to the moon? Oh, uh, so my, my background is actually in physics, uh, <laughs> physics and math um, with a minor in geology. And then um, I've taken some extra geo courses, kind of why I moved up here to Flagstaff. Flagstaff's a really, really good anal um, like analogous setting to the moon, which is why so many lunar missions came here. Um, our rock types are very similar to the rock types you'd find on the moon. And so there's a big geology base out here dealing with like um, uh, extraterrestrial exploration, right? Um, but yeah, I'm just a big rock nerd. And what's your special interest in the moon? What got that started? Oh, I think it's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, it's full of fun rocks. Uh, you know, I worked on um, some some data involving Pluto and, and other other things and the moon's a really really interesting source you know the moon came from the earth and uh, and so you can learn a lot about about earth's history by studying the moon because it's geologically inactive right. I just love it and I, I have a similar geology background sort of I picked a, I was picking blackberries when I was seven years old mm -hmm. and I found a fossil of brachiopod um, as I know now, and and I was hooked. Yeah. And so when I got to high school, my favorite teacher, I had some really good teachers, but the one that made the biggest impact was Mr. Leggett. I think we all had a Mr. Leggett probably, but he um, was an earth science teacher mm -hmm. and he was so much fun and inspiring that I went to school where he went to just because I wanted to do what, follow his footsteps and do geology. Um, and he was an upstanding teacher, but I, I focused on, on paleontology and worked at a museum in Florida, Florida Museum of Natural History, then ended up here at Lowell Observatory. And, um, and somewhere along the way, you know, started learning about the astronaut training and, and all, all the stuff that's still going on here. And it's, it's such a thriving community. Yeah. Flagstaff has, of course, Lowell Observatory. There's the US Naval Observatory, mm -hmm. the US Geological Survey, Northern Arizona University, um, those four major research centers um, that do um, all sorts of planetary studies and beyond. But the moon has been a focus of study. The USGS was brought here in the early 60s specifically to go to the moon. And the Naval Observatory and all, all the others were involved in Apollo in some way. And so the fact that we're going back, um, people going back and flex stuff is still involved, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty fun stuff. Do we have a lunar USGS, is that true? A lunar USGS. Mm -hmm. I've heard I've heard rumor that that um that our USGS is designated a lunar USGS. I have not heard that term. It was the original name was the Astrogeology Branch hmm. um, because astrogeology was you know that was the study of getting to the moon. That's what they were preparing for. So it, it'll be interesting to see how it develops down the road. Yeah. Um, as we go back, and we'll talk about this more about about exploring the moon. But next week, the 14th, is Artemis 1 is scheduled again to launch. And if all goes well, 2024 will be a crude launch around the moon. 
and that if all goes well, 2025, we could be walking on the moon again. And you know, it, it's so neat that we say every astronaut who's walked on the moon is trained here in the mm -hmm. flight staff, and that'll continue to be the case probably because those astronauts training are still still training here. And right. you know, the next this is the second lunar total lunar eclipse we had this year, mm -hmm. but the last one until 2025. Yeah. And it's exciting to think the next time we have one is also potentially the year that we're going to be walking on the moon again. That is cool. It's going to be a pretty yeah. cool moon year, mm -hmm. I think. And it's also um, going to be, we're going to be opening our new um, Astronomy Discovery Center in 2024. And so our, our programming, it's going to be really great to share that, oh, share the moon fun. stuff. It's going to be, you know, it's like a whole new era, it feels mm -hmm. like. I mean, you can come up here to Black Cat. Um, you know, to the Grand Canyon, uh, come visit us um, at Low Observatory, and then just go outside and play in the area that uh, is basically uh, a, an almost perfect playground replica of what the what the lunar surface is like, with um, you know all the cinders out there acting like the regolith, and like all the very very um, a comparable rock types. So you. We plan a fun vacation around coming up here and visiting our ADC and then playing on the plane of the moon. There, there's so much. There's going to be so much going on. And so we're really looking forward to that. Um, we're also looking forward to tonight, the next uh, two and a half hours, our coverage, just to, to give some time. And all these times are in um, Flagstaff time, Mountain Standard time, or Arizona time in general. It's a lot easier now that we're off daylight savings. Mm -hmm. It's not quite as confusing. Um, but but so the partial eclipse has begun. Totality begins in about 50 minutes. Okay, answer one of the questions. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's around when it'll be fully red, right? Because that's mm -hmm. that's when the only light coming through is going around the Earth. Yeah. So it'll be total from 3:16 to 4:41. So an hour, almost an hour and a half, which is pretty long. Um, that's the longest one that we're going to have for years. And then it goes out of totality um, at 4:41. Um, so, so that's a that's a pretty long time um, to be watching it. We're not going to watch the the complete partial on the other end because we start getting daylight coming up. Yeah. But but you know it, the cool part is always leading up to it, mm -hmm. and then totality. Yeah. And then I think once it starts going partial again, everybody's ready to go to bed. Yeah. It's it's the lead up to it. Um, so, but. You know, we have we have a we'll go to to Resi in just a couple of minutes, but maybe just a quick thought about the difference between the lunar eclipse and the solar eclipse. Yeah. Um, because we're going to have um, the next great American eclipse is 2024. In fact, we're going to be setting up in Texas, mm -hmm. um, in Waco, and we're working with Baylor University, um, City of Waco, Discovery. Um, it's going to be a really great event down there. So what's What's the difference between those two, lunar eclipse and solar eclipse? Yeah, sure. Oh, and um, uh, happy birthday, Lieutenant M and Hina. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Yes, thank um, you. So uh, the difference between a lunar and a solar eclipse is basically um, where the moon is and where Earth is compared to the sun. So the sun is just the light source. Just treat it like that. Um, if it goes, if um, the next one in line is Earth, right, then Earth's shadow is shining on the moon, and that's a lunar eclipse, right? Um, and then, but if it's the other way around, if it's the sun, and then um, the moon is next, and then Earth, it's a solar eclipse, right? Um, so uh, the moon's shadow is shining on the Earth. Uh, and from our perspective, what that looks like <clears throat> is someone covering the light up. And then we're basking in that, um, umbral shadow, that shade that's being thrown by the moon. Um, and so, uh, but from our perspective, it looks like the, the sun is being blocked by the moon. Um, and the same would be true if you were on the moon during a lunar eclipse. It would look like um, Earth was covering up the moon or covering up the sun, the light source. So it's just um, who's, who's throwing the shadow onto which source, um, but it's always the sun. Right. So, so a lunar eclipse only happens a full moon, and a solar eclipse only a new moon. Right, just to give where where they have to be in their orbit. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, we're going to, in just a minute, we're going to play our first uh, video where we'll hear from Resi. Um, it's about a seven-minute video about what an eclipse is. Um, and 
during that video and after, and in fact, throughout the entire coverage, um, for those watching, send in your questions and we'll be glad to get those again. Um, you can send them in via the YouTube chat and then um, our crack team behind the scenes, Nate and Cody, um, Sarah and Heather, and our all-star educators um, will, will help get us to those questions. Yeah. Hopefully, um, you know, any questions you have from the videos, we can do deep dives into the particular things that you like the most. Yeah, so so um, we want to make this as interactive as possible. And of course, you know, I keep looking at my phone where I've got the image of the moon and, and sometime in between, we're going to have to actually step outside yeah. um, to see it because it's, you know, it's it's just a fun thing to see. And, and a lunar eclipse is great because you don't need anything special. I mean, you have to be able to look up and see, you need clear skies, but otherwise you just look up, you don't need special technology or anything. So um, a lot of great stuff. We touched on a little bit what an eclipse is. So let's now hear from Resi Balco um, in this seven minute video. Hello, I'm Resi, Public Program Supervisor here at Lowell Observatory, and I am here to answer the question, what is a lunar eclipse? Uh, so we have our lunar eclipse happening tonight. We're moving closer and closer to it. As the moon rises, it's going to be moving into the Earth's umbra, the darkest part of the Earth's shadow. All right, so let's go ahead and jump on in. What is a lunar eclipse? Well, to talk about lunar eclipses, it helps to understand the phases of the moon. So down here, I have a sun, I have an earth, that's us, uh, I've got a moon right here, and so basically let's start with talking about moon phases. When I was a kid, I thought that the moon phases were caused by the earth's shadow. Here it would be like a round shadow. I thought, okay, you've got a crescent moon, here's the Earth's shadow, bam, beautiful crescent. But that doesn't actually make sense, right? Because we also get a half moon, and to get a half moon, you have to have this like straight line running through the moon. Well, the Earth is round, so we don't have any straight lines, right? Our shadow would be a circle. And so, moon phases, right, they're not caused by the Earth's shadow, they're caused by the moon's shadow. We have our sun right here, it's shining light this way, so I'll draw a little arrow, and that's the one that's going to light up part of the moon, and then the moon's own shadow, right, there's no sun casting light down here, so the moon's own shadow is what causes that dark part of the moon. So, let's go ahead and introduce Earth here. So for example, right here, if you're on Earth, you would not see a moon and the moon would be up in the daytime. That's a new moon. As we come to over here, you would only be able to see a little teensy sliver of the moon. From right here, if you're on Earth, you would see half of the moon. From over here, you would see a full moon and it keeps going with half a moon, another crescent, and then new moon. So those are how the moon phases work. They're caused by the moon's shadow, not the Earth's shadow, as the sun is shining on only half of the moon. If that's the case though, then when we're at this point right here, this full moon, you would think, well then wouldn't Earth cast a shadow? It's between the sun and the moon, um, but, we're working right now with like a piece of paper, right? This is two-dimensional space. We live in three-dimensional space. That means that we don't just go like side to side or side to side, we can also go up and down. And this is what happens, right? The moon is orbiting around the earth. It's making a little circle, but he's not orbiting on a perfect flat plane. If the earth is up here a little bit, our moon is sometimes further up, sometimes it's further down, and it kind of circles more like this. So that means for our average full moon, the Earth is actually maybe up here a little bit. And so the sun is still gonna shine directly on the moon, light up the whole thing for us, we still see a full moon. Or maybe Earth's down here and the moon's a little bit up here. But when we get a lunar eclipse, they are on the same plane. They are on this exact same level, and that means that our sun light now does pass through the earth, the earth's shadow does get cast 
on the moon. So this is then where we get a lunar eclipse as our shadow moves over that moon. Now, this is a dark circle, right? And you'll notice when we're looking at our lunar eclipse tonight that the moon doesn't just look dark, it actually looks red. So let's talk about where we get that red coloration. So our sun is shining light on Earth, right? And it's casting a shadow out on the moon. So we've got our sunlight coming, view sunlight. Our light is being filtered through the side of the Earth. And what's happening along here? This would be daytime on this side, nighttime on this side. So day, because that's where the sun is, night, because this is where just like black space is. Um, so that means that the sunlight is coming through these bits right here where day and night meet. And what's happening on Earth where day and night meet? Well, we're having sunsets. Um, light scatters. Different wavelengths of light, different colors, they scatter different amounts. You can see this visual that we're gonna put up here in just a second, and you can see that the blue light, which has a shorter wavelength, it scatters more than the red light. So this is what causes our sunsets, right? All of the blue light that is normally filling up our whole atmosphere is scattered around, so we get this beautiful blue sky. Um, all of that gets scattered away, and instead we start to see red, and that's what happens at sunset. Now, because the sun's light is coming at the moon from this direction, it's hitting that sunset part, and the blue light is like going like pew in this direction. And then the other colors, you know, they're going less and less as we go through like green and then like yellow. And then what ends up happening is the red light comes through this way and it's all that remains. So instead of getting a dark moon, as we move through Earth's umbra, the darkest part of Earth's shadow, we actually get a red moon. And what I think is neat about this is that, um, I think it was NASA put it this way last year for a lunar eclipse. They said that the moon is red because we're looking through all of Earth's sunsets all at once. So not only are we looking at our own shadow when we look at this lunar eclipse, we're also looking at all of the Earth's sunsets, all of the Earth's sunrises that are going on at that moment, all at once projected onto the moon. So that's where we'll get that red coloration. Well, thanks, Rezzy, for, for that video. And uh, we'll take some questions if anybody has any. Um, we, we've got a couple coming in. Um, why is the next eclipse not until 2025? Oh. Um, oh. Go ahead. No, thanks. Um, it's just the way that, you know, you have three bodies in motion and they all have to line up right for there to be an eclipse. Um, you know, and uh, sometimes it'll be like, here's the sun and the moon will be like a little bit too far down, right? And so it'll, we'll miss it. Um, and then eventually its orbit kind of moves around, the tilt that moves around to where it's, it's um, just perfectly in line for an eclipse. And I think on average, it's something like every year and a half, on average, is a total lunar eclipse. Mm -hmm. And then there are partial ones. Um, so the next total one will be 2025. We'll have some partial ones before then. Yeah. And of course, um, solar eclipses also, which aren't as common. Mm -hmm. um, and, and here's a question coming in. Why, why are lunar eclipses more common than solar eclipses? Oh, um, just because the moon orbits uh, mm -hmm. the Earth. And there's a, there's an interesting thing with the size. Also, we we live in a great time for solar eclipses, yeah. Because of because the apparent size of the sun, as seen with Earth with, from Earth, is the same as the apparent size of the moon. They mm -hmm. look exactly the same, even though the sun is so much bigger. It's also further away, and we just happen to live during a time when um, they're the same size. So so the sun can be completely covered. But what happens in down the road is because the moon is moving away from us, um, what is it, four inches or four centimeters or something like that? Something a year. Like that. Yeah, small um, amount of year. Oh, Sarah, Sarah wants me to correct. Um, uh, the, reason, the reason that there are more um, lunar eclipses than solar eclipses is because we're, we're looking at the, the thing that has the shadow on it for the lunar eclipse. 
So um, the you can see it from anywhere, right? Uh, and so it's more common to have one in your area, I guess. Um, and uh, but a, a solar eclipse, you have to have the shadow being cast go right over you to see it. Uh, if you were on the moon, it would be the opposite would be true, right? And they'd be, um, so, so in theory, they're just as common, but for any given place to be able to see it, it is much more common to see the lunar eclipse. So that's mm -hmm. a great correction, thank you. And you know, that gets in, into something interesting, some research that we do here at the observatory for years is occultation research. Mm -hmm. When we're studying shadows, mm -hmm. um, when I, when I, something like the moon or, um, you know, passes in front of a distant star, or maybe Pluto passes in front of a distant star, um, when it passes in front, that starlight is blinked out. And by timing um, how long it's blinked out, for instance, you can measure the diameter of the body. Um, and you can, that's how Pluto's atmosphere was discovered and the rings of Uranus were discovered. Mm -hmm. So um, studying those shadows and understanding how um, bodies move in space is really important. Um, Dr. Larry Wasserman, one of our astronomers here, has spent his entire career um, predicting when these things are going to happen. And it, it, Larry is so great because he's been here since the 1970s. I think he's our longest tenured staff member now. And he, he is such a computer nerd in terms of uh, doing all these predictions, running programs and stuff. But he also is out in the field. He's been all over the world mm -hmm. chasing shadows. Yeah. And it's, it's remarkable. And he still does this. I went on one of those. It was fun. Oh, there, it, it's yeah. a blast. It was really cool. You basically hang out and go camping with a, with a really cool telescope and to time exactly when you see the shadow. And you're like, well, I did my part. And it's, it's really like tiny. It's, it's nothing. It's like a big like, Blink, blink, there, it's recorded. But then everyone gets their data all together. And then it's basically the pixels of an image. And then you could see the, the body moving in front and get a really good idea of the shape of it and all that kind of stuff. It was really cool. It was like, well, I've got my little my little timer thing. And they put it all together. It was really fun. It's, and you know, you spend more time on the preparation yeah. and oh, the after than the actual So much more. <laughs> and yeah, if everything isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, you spend a lot of time and potential money mm -hmm. getting nothing, but it's but it's really um, some great research going on there. So we've got a couple of questions coming in. One from from Tiger Tiger Gilbert, um, sunset crater, and how it's similar to the to the moon. So it's it's not super similar, but there's a weird history for it. So um, you know, so sunset crater was a, is a volcanic uh, feature. So um, volcano um, goes boom, collapses a little bit. Um, I think it's a, a collapsed area, um, but mostly sunset crater is. Um, and for a long time, people thought that the uh, craters on the moon were volcanic features. You know, there were what's called calderas, which is um, this sort of like leftover, uh, the collapsed, um, you know, structure like so. If you're, what's the thing that you cook that collapses? If you, if you chip it, yeah, yeah. So they thought it was basically like souffle that collapsed, right? And then, and a lot of it has to do with they see these resurgent peaks. Um, you might be able to see one in the view now, uh, which is like a little mountain in the middle. And they said, well, that that usually forms when a crater collapses, but there's still heat underneath. It kind of like still bubbles it up and it tries to rise again. Uh, the big ones you can see it on are like. Tycho and Copernicus craters on the moon, but um, you can see it on, on top of them. But <clears throat> people thought for a long, long time that, okay, these are very circular craters. They've got this resurgent peak. Um, if they were from impacts, they assumed they would have like these um, slashes um, from them coming in at different angles. They'd be, you know, um, what do you call them, like oval shaped. Uh, but we now know that, um, that the, the the lunar ones are um, are pretty much all impact craters. There there are, we don't see any volcanic type type ones like that on the moon. Um, and the resurgent peak is just because whatever hit it hit it so hard, um, it rippled rippled the ground and kind of propped it up at the end. Uh, and the reason that they're circular is because um, we we found out that when an an impact hits, it's not that it's it's going bloop and making a little shape. It's penetrating the surface and then detonating, um, uh, blowing, blowing this giant perfectly spherical uh, 
sort of detonation, which causes a little circle. And, um, you know, that Tiger brings up a great point about um, Sunset Crater because geologists in the 60s were saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one geologist named Gene Shoemaker, um, among others, as, as NASA had declared that we're going to go to the moon, the goal was to beat the Russians. It was mm -hmm. all political. It was, it was the moon race part of the bigger, um, uh, the space race was part of the bigger um, um, Cold War. And so um, scientists, or so the NASA said we're gonna go to the moon and scientists like Gene Schumacher said, wait a minute, if we're gonna spend all this time and, time and money to go there and all we're doing is planting the flag and thumbing our nose at the Russians, what a wasted opportunity we should do science. And if we're gonna do science, we need to train these guys. Mm -hmm. And so Gene Shoemaker, again, was one of the, the pushers on this. He, he brought the US Geolo Geological Survey astrogeology branch here in the early 60s. And in fact, in 1963, um, the, the next nine group of astronauts that included Neil Armstrong and Jim Lovell and others, they came to do a test to see if it would be worth training, do geology training. And, and they went to Meteor Crater mm -hmm. as a, excellent analog to a lunar crater. They went to Sunset Crater for similar reasons, as well as to look at the volcanic rocks. Um, Kim Falol, we'll talk about this stuff a little bit later, but Sunset Crater was really critical to preparing to go to the moon. And in fact, later on, um, the USGS built a simulated crater field. Mm -hmm. Based on images of the moon, they, they made a crater field that looked like lunar surface in terms of the craters. And the first field they made is now part of a, a registered landmark area mm -hmm. that's protected. Um, so, so Sunset Crater has, has um, played a really nice role with that. Um, so, and, and it continues to, because the, the modern astronauts are still coming out and training in some of the same places. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Well, you said speed of Tycho Crater, and then you mentioned thumbing your nose. I thought you were gonna make a reference to um, uh, Tycho's nose. Tycho's <laughs> nose. Uh, weird, weird dude. Um, had a castle, not in castle times, um, and uh, had a sword duel with some friends one night at a party, and his nose went off. <laughs> and then he had a prosthetic nose, yeah. and he made a different. And depending on if he was meeting the unwashed or royalty, he mm -hmm. had a different nose. Yeah. Um, I think it was gold. He had a couple that were made of different material. Real metal dude. <laughs> So here's a, here's a question from Steve. Um, what year did the first Men on the Moon come out? And uh, that was a, that was a, a sci-fi movie that came out in 1964. Um, and I remember that because that's the year I was, I shouldn't admit this, but that's the year I was born. And that's the only year, in fact, from when we started going to space in 1961 till 1972, the last missions on the moon, that's the only year we didn't have missions because we first had the Mercury missions and then starting in 1965, the Gemini missions. Um, so that's a, that's, there's so many great sci-fi movies and moon theme movies out there. And, and I'll also mention that just a couple minutes at 2.50, uh, we're gonna take about 10 minutes um, and just so you can look at the moon and we're also gonna take a jump outside and look at ourselves because we're seeing it on the screen, but we're kind of nerdy and we yeah. wanna see the real thing. So we'll, we'll take a couple more questions before we get to that. Um, uh, let's see, somebody's asking if we can see the eclipse in India. No, sorry, it's daytime in there. Yeah, it's just the you know, location thing. Um, let's see. And yeah, later on we can pull up a, a map that shows where the eclipse is visible mm -hmm. um, and you know, luckily here where we are in Northern Arizona in Flagstaff, um, it's a great location. You know, we had the last total lunar eclipse was in May and it was about as well timed as possible because it was an early evening. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids could stay up yeah, and see part of it. A little champagne oh, jam. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. But, but now it's, it's great for late nighters. Uh, my daughter might be out working right now, hopefully taking a look at it, um, but otherwise, you have to be a little committed or should be committed mm -hmm. um, if you're going to spend oh, this, this long to do this. Um, so so uh, we'll take a look in just a couple minutes and somebody commented about um, Low Observatory and Pluto. Yeah. 
you know, we're we're talking about the moon, but we have such a really unique heritage here at Lowell Observatory. Um, Lowell was established in 1894, which is 18 years before our state, Arizona, was even established. It was Arizona Territory. And the observatory was founded by a guy named Percival Lowell, who was interested in proving the existence of intelligent life on Mars. Well, through the years, um, so, so much important research was done here. The first evidence of the expanding universe was detected on the telescope. It's about, I don't know, 75 yards from where we're sitting right now. And that's the telescope that Percival Lowell used and also one that visitors can look through at night, our 24 inch refractor. In 1930, Clyde Tombaugh famously discovered Pluto. He was 24 years old mm -hmm. and he discovered Pluto. Um, culminating a search for a ninth planet that had started 25 years earlier. So there's so much heritage here, but what's so neat is those aren't just historic footnotes. That's the foundation for what's still happening today, mm -hmm. our research going on. And we're gonna talk more about that later on. I think now um, we're gonna take a little break and just enjoy some views of the moon. Um, we'll be back in about 10 minutes and play another um, video about super moons and orbits um, with Dylan Chapman. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Enjoy that Bella Luna.
Hi, I'm Dylan, an educator here at Lowell Observatory. Have you ever heard of a supermoon before? I'm going to talk a little bit about the moon's orbit and how it explains where this idea of a supermoon comes from. So what keeps us here on the Earth and the moon orbiting around it is gravity. The mass of the Earth warps space-time kind of like a heavy bowling ball on a trampoline. And so this causes what we perceive as the force of gravity, drawing things towards it and allowing for orbits around it. The moon takes about 27.3 days to go around the Earth once. And this is known as the moon's sidereal period. It takes a little bit longer to go from full moon to full moon because the Earth is also moving around the sun. And so that comes in at just under a month at 29 and a half days. The moon, as with most things in the universe, doesn't orbit in a perfect circle. Rather, it orbits in an ellipse. And so this means at one point in the moon's orbit, it's a little bit closer to the Earth, and at one point, it's a little bit further away. At its furthest, the moon is about 253,000 miles from the Earth. This is known as apogee. And at its closest, the moon is about 226,000 miles away from the Earth. And that is known as perigee. So to put this into perspective, the moon on average is about 3 billion cans of beans from the Earth. But its distance varies by about 400 million cans of beans. And this animation shows that change in distance. It's also worth mentioning that all this is happening at a slight tilt. Sometimes the moon will be a little bit above or below how the Earth orbits around the sun. And that's actually why we don't have eclipses more often. So let's get this back to supermoons. Now what causes a supermoon is when the full moon matches up with when the moon is at perigee, when it's at its near point. Because it's a little bit closer, it can appear slightly larger in the sky and also brighter, but despite its name being supermoon, the difference between a supermoon and any other full moon isn't always all that obvious. So let's say we wanted to see the moon as large and as bright as we possibly could. Well, there's a couple things that you could do. For one thing, uh, the way that we see the moon in the sky actually changes depending on where you are on the Earth. Now, here's a picture of a supermoon when it's near the horizon and also when it's high up in the sky. And because of the Earth's rotation, bringing the second image a few thousand miles closer to the moon, it actually appears slightly larger. Another thing you could do is be near the equator and the Earth isn't actually a perfect sphere. It actually bulges out near the equator, which would bring you slightly closer to the moon, further from the center of the Earth. All right, so now you know what a supermoon is, how to get the most out of one, and a little bit more about the moon's orbit. And I just wanna say thank you to our members and donors uh, for making all this possible. Well, we're back. I um, hope you enjoyed the view and the video. And um, if you have any questions, again, please send those in. Again, I'm, I'm John Compton, um, or educator and expert on the moon. And I'm Kevin Schindler, the historian at Lowell Observatory. And we're just delighted to have you with us here. I got a message from Haley Johnson, who's watching from up at the Grand Canyon. So thanks for tuning in and also taking a look in Rich Bonner um, down in, in Cottonwood. Also, um, both both setting up his own telescope, taking pictures, and also tuning us in. So thanks for joining us, and thanks to all our donors and supporters who make this sort of thing possible. Low Observatory, we're a nonprofit organization, um, and our, our mission is to communicate science. We do that through research, through our outreach programs, and um, it's a partnership. It's a partnership with donors, uh, with, with community, of Flagstaff community, with the science community, with the informal science. We have a lot of different partners and it's really a thrill to be able to work with so many different groups. So thank you for your support and thanks everybody for joining us. And also if you're watching, 
um, sometime during the broadcast, take a minute and um, send in a comment. Let us know where you're watching from, because we know we have um, several thousand people tuning in right now. But it'd be interesting to see where you're watching from. So we're gonna we're gonna chat a little bit. We're we're getting kind of excited here because totality is only 11 minutes away. So we're gonna we're gonna chat for a little bit, and then um, we'll take a little break as totality starts. So let's let's until then let's take some questions. Um, here's one. What's in the in the media? You've probably seen that this is called um, the Beaver Moon, um, or the Beaver Red Moon, Blood Red Moon, uh, different nicknames. So let's talk about what that nickname, the Beaver Moon, means. So I don't know about the the, the Beaver Moon itself, but I do know that um, <clears throat> you know each each full moon has a different name because uh, it was used as an early uh, calendar system, right? And um, a lot of times they are associated with, uh, the names are associated with things common for that month, I guess. Um, you know, there's, uh, it's not coincidence that there's roughly 12 full moons, roughly, uh, and, um, and that, that many months, right? Um, it was used as an early calendar system, just like the Zodiac was used as an early calendar system. Um, either people that were uh, lunar centric or uh, stellar centric when they when they um, were kind of <clears throat> figuring out these things. I feel like the um, full moon is easier to track for me because you don't have to be up at night. You can see like, mm -hmm. hey, it's going through its phases, it's new moon, it's, it's you know, um, waxing and waning. And then you can sort of guess, hey, that's when the full moon will be. Do you know why it's specifically either though? Yeah, well, the, the like you were saying that each one has a specific one and it, it kind of has to do with something is happening that month. Like the harvest moon in October is harvest time. The beaver moon, there's a couple different ideas of what that comes from. One is that um, it's when the trappers would, would, would set the traps for the beavers oh, yeah. or also when the beavers are most active before winter sets in. Mm -hmm. um, so it has something to do with, with um, activities of beavers. So it's just a general nickname, it's not a, it, it's not scientific, it's, it's part of the culture yeah. and, and how people have looked at the sky um, to tell time and, and associate with seasons and things like that. Um, so, so like a lot of things that, you know, the moon has so much cultural history um, that, and those names really refer to that. Um, here's another question, is the moon bigger than earth? Uh, no, it's like a quarter of the size. It's like um, that apple compared to your face. <laughs> but, but a lot farther away <laughs> um people think that the moon is like it's like oh here's the earth and then here's the moon no they're really far apart if they were to scale of like your head and, an, and your fist or an apple it'd be like across the room like, that's very a, far away. about the diameter of the united states it continues to the united states yeah. roughly and pluto by the way is about half that size roughly and so you know we think about you know pluto being discovered here and for years, Pluto was a dot. <laughs> that was about it. The best telescopes always see was a dot because relative to the other planets, it's smaller, a lot smaller. And also it's further away than the other. So it's just a dot. Um, in the 1990s, one, a Lowell scientist named Mark Bowie um, was one of the lead authors on creating the first maps of Pluto. They were just kind of dark and light areas, the albedo changes. Uh, but not till New Horizons went by in 2015 did we see Pluto as a planet mm -hmm. um, in terms of how it looked with the heart shape and everything. We, we missed one question that I had set up <laughs> a callback for. Um, someone wanted to know if the moon will be blue. Uh, no, a blue moon is just what you call when you have two full moons in the month because it's not exactly 12 full moons. Um, and the, I, I believe the blue in it just comes from like the same same reason like a like a blue ribbon moon you know like that kind of thing um like th that's that special bonus moon that you get uh i just thought it was fun yeah. <laughs> so yeah. i was like i was like roughly 12 and then we skipped it i was like no people can think of a chart <laughs> no here's another question is it true saturn will be seen up close also and not, not, not like the moon. Are we in opposition? No. Well, we're we're um, when Saturn is roughly closest. Opposition was a month or six, month or two away ago, um, when it was closest. But 
Saturn on average is 880 million miles away. Um, Jupiter is half that. The moon is a quarter million miles away, 240,000 miles away. So the moon is always going to appear the biggest of anything in the sky of, of the bodies. Yeah. Mar yeah. Mars, Mars gets closer and further away, but Mars will never, contrary to the August whatever, 2000, whatever news report that came out every August that Mars was going to appear as big as the full moon. Mm -hmm. That just isn't going to happen. Um, it'll be closer than on average sometimes. It's still going to look like a dot in the sky. Yeah. The Saturn will be closer, um, and it might sometimes it'll, it'll be a, appear a little brighter, but it's still going to be just a point of light. And do you know that when the moon hits its stable, um, when it when it stabilizes, like we know that it's it's moving away from us, um, but that will eventually that will slow down and eventually reach an equilibrium. And at that point, the moon will be a tiny little dot in the sky. Mm -hmm. um, it, it will not be very big. So enjoy it while we got it, folks. Yes, right. So here's a question from Cecil: How does the moon affect the human body? Uh, I think it mostly affects it with like. Um, circadian rhythms and things like that like um and the like i know that the tides i mean our bodies are mostly water we're basically just bags of water and um bones and stuff uh <laughs> i i know doctor um but uh I, I don't believe that the 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 gravity effect has you can like it's noticeable um the the you know you do get these big tidal bulges but a lot of that is from the lack of the moon as well, like the lack of gravity uh, from on the far side of the Earth from the, from the moon. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it would have too much effect on on the. No, I mean, gravity gravity is everywhere. Gravity affects everything. Um, it's it's constant field, right? So um, it has some effect, guaranteed. But is it noticeable? Not to me. Not day to day. <laughs> well, here's another one. Here's a good question from Little Cloudy. If someone were on the surface of the moon during a total lunar eclipse in the spot where the eclipse is visible to us from Earth, which is pretty much the whole face of the moon as we see it, would the red shadow also be visible to the person on the moon? Probably not, because it would look it would look exactly like a uh, a solar eclipse, but it would cover a lot more. Um, and so I, I think uh, the effect of staring at the sun would block out any of the red. Mm -hmm. And you talk about red, we're only four minutes from totality, three minutes from totality beginning. And when we get there, we'll, we'll, pro we'll probably take a little break so we can run out and, um, well, we'll take a break at 3.20. We'll talk about it a little bit when it goes in there. So we'll take a few more questions here. Um, why is the, total, the eclipse not happening in for three years? Years. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about these as, as our viewers change, we'll answer these questions. Sometimes the same question throughout the night, but um, it's good to revisit that. Um, why we had one earlier this year in May, mm -hmm. but we don't have another one, total lunar eclipse until 2025. Yeah, you, just, you, you have to be in a very nice, perfect line with the Earth, Moon, and Sun <clears throat> to make it work, or you know, the other way around as well. Um, it just, they have to be lined up perfectly. and um, their orbits aren't always, you know, um, perfectly lined up. And when they come back around and they happen to be in the right spot, then we, we get them. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of great questions coming in. We'll get to as many as we can right now. Um, why is the moon so bright? It's, uh, it's being blasted by sunlight. Um, it's actually pretty dark. It's the color of asphalt. Um, but the moon is, is shining extremely or the, the sun is shining extremely brightly on the surface mm -hmm. and here's another question about size is pluto the same size as mercury no and no we'll go no <laughs> we're we're just mentioning how how um pluto pluto is the smallest of the traditional nine planets um and it's it's about half the diameter of the united states Ooh, to give it, yeah so it's a it's a fair bit smaller um, here's a question. What's the supermoon? Supermoon is when um, the moon is also, uh, um, it's basically as close to Earth as it's going to be in its, in its orbit. So it looks bigger by, by a measurable amount. 
And here's a question about Saturn's Saturn's rings. Are they made of moons? Uh, it's made of ice, um, and they're going away as well. So they're transient. Um, the right. fact the fact that I think is cool is um, they are uh, newer than the Appalachian Mountains, and uh, they will be gone before the Appalachian Mountains are gone. And there, it's interesting with the with the <clears throat> rings of Saturn because there are these ice balls, and they're mixed in. There's at some point, what do you call a moon? It was just a chunk of ice. Yeah. And it's how do you define it? But but if you if you were to look at Saturn's rings, they extend from one end of the ring. If you extend it to the other on the other side of the rings, like if this was Saturn's rings, Saturn's in the middle, from one to the other, that's about three quarters of the distance to the moon. And yet the width of the rings is only half mile. Yeah. So very thin layer. Uh, let's see, a um, couple more questions here. So Lost Planet Numuru, check out the podcast, uh, Star Stuff, um, where we talk about uh, interesting theories. Here's a, here's a good question um, that's a good, good for us to remind ourselves about. Can we watch the lunar eclipse with the naked eye? And that's a great question because, because you know, we think about solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, is the moon going to be too bright or not, you know, whatever. Um, you can look at the moon anytime with the unaided eye, with the naked eye. It might be kind of bright. It might be a little bit bright to look at, like looking in the headlights of a car um, when it's really bright, but it's okay. The sun, on the other hand, you should never look at the sun. If it's a solar eclipse, um, the only time you can look is when it's completely, totally eclipsed. Um, but if it's partially eclipsed, you don't look at it because you're going to damage your eyes. So, so it's okay. It's okay to look at a lunar eclipse. If you're not going to do any damage or anything like that. I think we're um, breaching into totality now. We're at yes, we should be at totality right now. And so, um, for the next hour plus, um, go take a look at the moon because it's going to appear. It should appear. We haven't seen it yet, but it should appear. Um, Nice and um, kind of a reddish color, um, and so we'll we'll take a few more questions as we're getting views of that, and then at, at three twenty we'll just take a break and just let everybody just go and enjoy. So we're just kind of scrolling through uh, our um, questions here. Um, as the moon gets farther away, won't it eventually leave our orbit? Uh, no, and I kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. It it will reach a, a stable point. Um, where it's uh, fully, it'll actually be fully tidally locked. There'll be no wiggle anymore. Um, and that'll, it'll be pretty far away and it'll be pretty, pretty far uh, in time from now. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, you got some time to enjoy it. And, and um, thanks to Sarah Bircher and I, our entire outreach team, education team for um, getting us the telescope views. Um, Sarah was just commenting um, how when we've been leading up in partial eclipse, um, sometimes it, it's hard to get a good view because the camera is, is going between the brightness of the moon and the darkness. And so the exposure can get kind of funky. But once the moon's eclipse, it's just this consistent reddish hue. It's not real bright in one area, real dark. And so except for clouds, um, the views should be real consistent that we can see. Um, um, why do we not have eclipses for other planets? We do. They're called transits. <laughs> uh, you know, you see them, <clears throat> see them often, or often enough. Okay, what would the Earth's atmosphere have to be made of to make the shadow on the moon look blue? Oh. Now, what elements would that be? I don't. I, I, not a billion years. I have no idea. Um, yeah, I'm not. I don't know what that would be. Like. I don't know don't what know. scatters. What would scatter to blue effectively like that? Um, here's a, another question. How do we track the north and the south node of the moon's orbit? Is there an astronomical difference between the eclipses at either node? Uh, it's just, we just look and see the, the, the point that it rotates around, right? Um, the magnetic field of the moon is non-existent anymore. Um, uh, you know, we have glass beads that have had um, the Earth's magnetic field embedded in them from, from impact. Uh, but um, so like it, it would just be a look at it, wiggle, look at it, 
rotate. Um, that's kind of the line. Yeah, okay. And again, let's revisit again um, why it appears red. Yeah, it's, um, it's red because, uh, you know, the, the sunlight is can only shine around the Earth and basically Earth's um, atmosphere is uh, um, refracting the light and, and um, scattering the light uh, into the red. And it's the same reason we get sunsets. So if you really want to think about it, the only color, the only light hitting the moon during the, the totality is sunset light. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Kayla um, to both of us. Do you have a favorite moon phase? What about you? I, I, I guess probably a full moon because um, because the romance of it, mm -hmm. the, the cultural history of it, and the fact that we can get an eclipse. Yeah. So I guess I guess probably not. I, although I also like first quarter um, for for viewing. Yeah. <laughs> um, third quarter is great also, mm -hmm. but first quarter. I'm, I guess I'm more familiar with that side of the moon. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I don't know. I'll take anything with the moon. First quarter is mine because you, you get a lot more. You can, as the uh, terminator of the moon, like that's that the mm -hmm. sunset line crosses the moon. Um, you get you get like all it casts deeper shadows in the craters and all the geology stuff that I enjoy. Oh yeah, <laughs> and I, I like first quarter because um, some of my favorite the Apollo history and the early mm -hmm. flights like Apollo Eleven. It's fun to be able to point out where they landed, mm -hmm. and you get that during the first quarter. Also, there's um, some sometime during around the first quarter when you get Perbex cross, um, which is that phenomenon. It only happens during first quarter for I don't know a couple hours, where you get this phenomenon where there's there's several different craters. I think it's like, I think it's like four craters, and the shadow is just right where it's crossed. Oh, that's fun. It's called Perbex cross, um, and you can't even see it every first quarter, mm -hmm. everything has to be just right. Um, you know, I, I've had this question through the years, also my favorite thing to look at through the telescope. And there's so many great things, but my favorite is the moon. Yeah. Because, cool. because geologists have back, you know, his background, you can see analogs, things that we're familiar mm -hmm. with and the details and the, the history of going there and going back there. You could explore it for forever. With, with a home telescope or even just like a, a binocular set. Mm -hmm. There's so many cool features on the moon and every day brings new features to light as you view because of that Terminator line crossing. Yeah, and I think I think since we have so many questions, let's just um, keep answering those sure. as they come through. And we might take a little break in a few minutes, but we want to try to get as many questions as possible. Um, can So why is the moon not look as red in Houston, or uh, does it? I would say it's, a, it's probably a combination. Um, uh, you know, we've got a, li a little bit of enhancing of our, uh, with the telescope, right? It's gonna be able to, to, to see a lot more than your, your naked eye can. Um, I don't think smog has much to do with that. I think um, there might be some effects from uh, like light pollution in general, and and just humidity. So it's not necessarily the geographic location; it's it's local conditions. Yeah, that yeah. might have some to do we, with it. We've been pushing dark sky stuff since Percival yeah. Lowell basically got here. You know, so. And I I just put on my Houston Astros hat in honor of Cody, who's managing all the operations here, our our marketing manager and guru. Um, so she she lived in Houston, and of course. They won the World Series, which some people like, some people don't, but um, we just hear cheering back there. But the Astros are tied into the moon because um, in 1962, Houston got a new baseball team. They call them the Colt 45s, and they played at whatever stadium. But in 1965, a new stadium was going to open called the Astrodome, and it was named after the astronauts who were training in that area. Um, and so the team decided to change the name to Astros to follow along with Astrodome. Um, so that's how they got their name. And that's why Cody was cheering just a minute ago because of the Astros. The lone Astro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, um, here's a question from Laura. Was there a meteor shower this morning or last night? There was, there was a minor, I think the tail end of a minor shower 
The next major one is the Le Leonids later this month, and the Geminids are in December. And we there are several minor um, meteor showers also. Um, and I'm not sure if we were on the tail end of one of those. We can look that up. Um, here's a here's a fun question. What's the ratio of moons to planets in the galaxy? Oh, it's way off. Um, just just because of Saturn and Jupiter. I mean, we're looking at. Oh. Yeah, that's um, it. And you know, we could just even if we just look at our galaxy. I mean, I mean, our our um, our solar system, because you know, we don't know if our solar system is typical or not. Up until just a few years ago, we knew of one solar system, a star with nine planets, nine traditional planets. Um, but you know, recent years we're finding planets around other stars. Um, and they have moons, but it's still early in this in the stage. In our in our solar system, um, we have what two two planets that don't have moons: mm -hmm. Mercury and Jupiter. Mars has two. Earth has one. Yeah. Jupiter's got dozens. Saturn's got Saturn. dozens. Um, Pluto's got five mm -hmm. that we know, and these are all that we know of that have been named. So, I um, mean, it, it'll be interesting to see. Um, and this is something our scientists are working on. Um, is characterizing planets around other stars. Um, how many are there? Can, we have no idea. We're, yeah. we, we know better now, maybe, I guess, because scientists are finding new planets every day. Mm -hmm. But are, the, are those planet systems typical? Is ours typical? We don't know. And then moons around them. It's, it's amazing to think, you know, we're not finding moons around other planets yet, but we will eventually. But when you think, you look up in the sky in a dark night, and you can see a couple thousand stars in the dark night. And there are so many more, that's just what we can see in view. And if you think Earth is a million times smaller than the sun, so if we're looking up at all those points of light, average stars, you're looking at something a million times smaller than a point of light. And yet we're detecting that. It's, yeah. it's, it's amazing, the technology. So finding a moon, um, that's down the road yet around other stars, but it'll, it's one of the many questions that astronomers are working on. Not today, but one day. One day. Um, here's a question. Um, <laughs> well, here's a fun one. I know it's red because the only light hitting it is the sunset, but why did she leave me? What did I do wrong? Um, I don't know. That's something um, you'll have to see your um, counselor about that one. Um, I don't think we can answer that one. So here's another one. Does Lowell have a bifocal Santilli lens telescope? Um, no, not that I know of. Um, I don't think we have anything like that. Uh, let's see. Um, will it be brighter? Will the brightness of the moon change? The, the redness, will that get brighter or dimmer? Um, as we get, I think as we get toward maximum, you know, the middle of the eclipse, I think that's what that's yeah. referring to. The total eclipse. Uh, we, we're getting some great comments here that are kind of fun. We'll share a couple of these, but also we want to get to our questions. And in, in two minutes, we're going to, oh no, we're going to just keep chatting yeah, here because we have chatting. so many good questions. Um, so what influences the speed of a lunar eclipse? Like, and I think that's just, you know, the speed of the shadow moving across. Yeah, um, I would say distance. And here, here's another one. Like we were starting to talk about this, if the, if the, the, the total eclipse moon as it's red, is it going to get brighter or not? Um, and I, probably not. I mean, I don't, I don't think that'll will change. It'll be probably consistent with it. It's not like, I mean, it's completely eclipsed. It's completely in shadow. Yeah. So it's not like it's the darker part of it. Yeah, the darker, it's, it's all of that, yeah. Uh, let's see. How much of the Earth's shadow um, yeah, gotcha. 
Oops. Oh, here we have Jude watching from England. Thanks for joining us. Um, and a good, maybe a good time to um, refresh. How does the lunar eclipse happen? As we're getting our view right now for the next hour and 20 minutes or so. Um, so uh, the, the lunar eclipse is formed basically by um, the earth making shadow puppets on the moon, right? So this, you get the sun and it's shining its light very brightly and it's very, it's resulting as um, very straight, straight lines of, of light. Um, and then the earth is in the way and uh, it happens to be shining those direct line light uh, makes that very, very nice pronounced shadow on the moon as they kind of like line up. Okay. Um, here's a question from Darwin. Can someone tell me why the eclipse for me is not visible yet, but the moon was just out, now it disappeared? I guess it, it depends on where you're, locate, where you're located because it, not the entire world isn't gonna be able to see it. Um, there's a certain path um, that is gonna be visible plus we get into daylight also. Um, here's a question, is this the best it will look right now? I guess that's a, Relative question, yeah. but um, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't see the feed right now. But um, you know, if it's cloud free, um, where you're viewing from, or if you're looking at ours, um, it probably will be. Um, it's not. It probably isn't going to get better or worse. It's going to stay like this um, until whatever time for 4:41 is when totality ends. So. Um, so yeah, there's uh, keep bringing some of the questions. Let us know where you're watching from. And again, we'd like to thank our sponsors and donors and viewers for joining us. Um, this, you know, sharing astronomy is the core of who we are here at Lowell Observatory. Um, our founder, Percival Lowell, said, what's the point of doing science unless you share it? And, and as he termed it, he said, uh, make people co-discoverers. Mm -hmm. And he did that by giving public lectures, by writing popular books, um, by, by being in the newspaper. And we do that today. Our scientists share the results of their research um, via um, um, scientific papers um, and by doing public talks and by going to professional programs. Um, and sometimes the story will share it via media um, to share it with the world. Our educators, um, share it with on-site programs. Before COVID, we were getting 105,000 visitors a year. And because of that, we were kind of bursting at the seams. So in two years, we're opening our new Astronomy Discovery Center. Um, and it's, the, it's gonna change everything dramatically. There's gonna be so much more of what we can, what we can do. Um, phase one of our expansion for our public was opening the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory, mm -hmm. um, which is, an instant star party. You roll yep. this building back and there are six telescopes. In fact, one of those telescopes, a five and a half inch tech, um, um, which stands for telescope or engineering um, company. Um, that's what we're broadcasting um, our view of the eclipse with tonight. That's from our Giovanni Open Deck Observatory or GODO as we call it. So, um, you know, our, our science and education is thriving here. And for us to be able to be part of this and share the excitement, it, it kind of, you know, we're only, gosh, we're about 50 feet from where our founder is entombed on site here. His mausoleum is just back from where we're sitting outside this building. And it feels like there's some connection with, with him that we're doing what he wanted us to do, to, to do science and to share it and to inspire people. And so we appreciate everybody joining us. Um, so yeah, let's let's look at a couple more questions. Um, oops, I messed up the cursor there. When will the next live stream be with Q and A broadcast? Um, interactive stargazing 2.0 with me, John Compton, All right. on November seventeenth. The, 17th. the, John, the Compton. John G. Compton uh, on November seventeenth. Um, uh, 10 p.m. Mountain Time. So. November 17th. What, what day? Is that Thursday? Yeah. yeah, Because that's the same day we're also doing the LDT. Global. 10th anniversary. Because this is the 10th anniversary since first light. 
of um, of the LDT. So we've oh, been wow. celebrating every month with that. It's gonna be fun. And hang out, bug me on Zoom. Yeah. Um, ask me lots of questions and um, send me all your corrections <laughs> in the Discord. <laughs> there is a question from David. Um, depending on the time zone, why is the shadow in different positions? Uh, it shouldn't be. Um, you know, uh, we're we're literally just making a shadow puppet on the moon. Um, and so you should be able to see it basically the same from everywhere. Um, it's not like a solar eclipse where the shadow is crossing us. Um, and so you can only see it in certain areas. Um, I don't know, lag? Mm -hmm. Not on our end. <laughs> and will the moon ever turn completely red? Um, it's going to be... I mean, it's it's going to be as red as it's going to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think it's going to be like crazy, crazy red. Like if you see if you see the pictures where it looks like red, red, um, someone someone bumped that around in Photoshop later. Yeah. <laughs> um, to, you know, it, it, it there's definitely a red tint to it, um, and it is very distinct. Uh, but unless you're moving some sliders around. It's not going to look like yeah. like the color of an apple or anything. There are a couple of questions about kind of the the physics of of, of eclipses and how they happen. Um, is there anything abnormal happening in our atmosphere um, when eclipse is happening? Uh, I don't think for a lunar eclipse, at least. Um, you know, sometimes you get you get effects from a, a solar eclipse because it, it makes it a little bit chillier. Right, and that's that kind of leads to the next question. Um, do some eclipses somehow cause cloudy weather? Um, lunar eclipses, no, but like you said, with solar eclipses, the sun is being blocked out, so the temperature will, will dramatically drop, noticeably drop, um, and and you sometimes will get some um, condensation, some clouds forming. Um, solar eclipses totality is interesting because if you're out in the middle of nowhere, it's it's turned dark. And and you start getting nocturnal animals and mm -hmm. crickets and things like that that you don't get during the day normally. So, um, it you know there are different experiences for sure. Um, here's a question from Darwin in New York. I'm in New York City and I saw the moon a couple of minutes ago, but when the eclipse started, and I'm thinking probably totality, it disappeared. So am I going to have to wait? Um, it's, it certainly can be hard to pick up yeah. um, if you're not sure where to look. Um, it, you know, it, it, it can certainly appear that reddish color, but it's not going to be nearly as bright as the full uneclipsed moon. Yeah. And so um, it's going to be kind of, you know, over in the west, southwest, um, in that area of the sky. Yeah, yeah Darwin. This is not being able to find it is the cool part. <laughs> <laughs> All right, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to um, go back to uh, play another video. It looks like uh, the next one is um, talking about the moon and tides. No, am, I, am I in the right time? I might be. Yeah, moon and tides. So we'll go back to that in a couple of minutes. And we're just still plowing through a lot of questions. Um, let's see. Yeah, a lot of questions about it. I don't know if you want to see it. Yeah, it'll, it'll pop back out. Why does a lunar eclipse, why does it take longer, or why does it last longer than a solar eclipse? I don't know. <laughs> um, what do you think about it? Well, the, it's, the it's the size of the shadow, right? That um, with a solar eclipse, it's just a very small shadow in the lunar. Yeah, it's, 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 a much, it's the moon's shadow as opposed to the Earth's shadow. That makes sense. Yeah. So we have one more minute, then we're going to go to our next video um, by Matt Lighty um, about the moon and its tides. And so let's just um, take one more as the meteor shower tonight as well. We, um, we're we thinking there's not, there's not a major one going on right now, um, but the next major one is going to be November. So we'll stop taking questions for a minute and um, and we'll go to um, this video about tides, and then we'll come back um, and take some more questions. 
and talk about some other stuff going on um, here at the observatory. So we'll be back in just a few minutes. Hello everyone, my name is Matt. I'm an educator here at Lowell Observatory. I hope you all are enjoying the lunar eclipse. Um, I'm going to talk to you all about the moon and the tides. So what exactly are the tides? How I like to think about the tides is um, the, the rising and lowering of the, the level of the ocean. So during the day you'll have high tides, which is going to be the highest point that water reaches along the shoreline, and then you'll have low tides, which is the lowest point that water will reach along the shoreline. And each day you'll have two high tides and two low tides. Now what exactly causes um, these, these tides? What causes the water to, to move like this? Well, the main contributor is the moon, specifically the moon's gravitational force uh, on the Earth. So if we look here, um, we can see these arrows on, on this diagram. These arrows represent the gravitational pull of the moon on the Earth. On the side of the Earth that's closest to the moon, there is the largest gravitational pull, and we can see that with the largest arrow. And as you move away from the moon, um, the arrows get smaller and smaller because the gravitational force of the moon on the Earth gets smaller and smaller. Now if we go ahead and insert the um, tidal bulges, um, we can see that on the side of the Earth closest to the moon, there is a tidal bulge. And this is because the, the gravity is stronger, so the water gets pulled to the moon. So you end up with a, a bulge of water. And this is going to be one of your high tides. Now on the opposite side of the Earth, there's actually also a high tide, which is kind of counterintuitive, um, and it didn't make sense to me at first. Um, there's a couple of ways you can think about it. How I like to think about it um, is the, the moon is kind of trying to stretch out the Earth. Um, since it's pulling on different areas of the Earth with different strength, um, one of the results is that the Earth is going to get um, stretched out or elongated. Now what this means is that you end up with a bulge on the side of the Earth that's closest to the moon and a bulge on the, the side of the Earth that's furthest away from the moon. Uh, another way you can think about it is the gravitational force on the far side of the Earth is so weak that the, the water doesn't really move. It doesn't really experience a force that would cause it to move. So it kind of just stays there and you end up with a high tide. Now, the moon isn't the only thing that exerts a gravitational force on the Earth. We also have the sun, the, the object that the Earth rotates around. And since the sun exerts a gravitational force on the Earth, you end up with tides from the sun as well. So I'm going to go ahead and and insert the lunar and solar tides. Now, since the sun is so far away, um, the tidal forces from the sun are about half as strong as the tidal forces from, from the moon, so you end up with tides that are about half as high. Um, now, we start here in third quarter. In third quarter, the moon and the sun are not aligned, um, meaning that the, the tides don't line up. Um, in this case, you're gonna end up with neap tides, which is gonna be when you have the lowest high tides and the highest low tides because the, the tides of the sun and the tides of the moon are not lining up. Now if we continue through the lunar cycle and we end up at new moon, now the moon and the sun are lined up. And when these two are lined up, the tides are lined up. Um, this is when you're gonna end up with spring tides, which is gonna be when you're gonna have the highest high tides and the lowest low tides. If we continue through the lunar cycle, Next up is first quarter. We're once again going to have these neap tides where the, the two tides do not line up. And then we end with full moon where the, the tides are lined up once again. And this is where we're at right now. So if you were to go outside um, tonight or if you were to, to study the tides over the course of the next day, you're gonna have the highest high tides and the lowest low tides. Now let's get into something called tidal slowing. As the earth rotates, it actually brings the tidal bulge with it. So if we um, play this, we can see that as Earth rotates, it rotates the tidal bulge away from the moon. Well, the moon doesn't like this. The moon wants the tidal bulge to be lined up. It applies a corrective gravitational force, trying to pull this, this bulge back to being aligned with, with the moon. And this, this gravitational pulling actually pulls against the rotation of the Earth and slows it down. Every day, um, this tidal slowing slows Earth's rotation by about 500 billionths of a second. Um, in order for it to slow the Earth's rotation by a single second, you'd have to wait 50,000 years. Um, so not something we're necessarily going to note, um, but it is a cool phenomenon caused by the Moon's gravitational effect on the Earth. I want to thank our members and donors for making uh, videos like this possible and, and live streams like this possible. So thank you. 
Thanks, Matt, for telling us about tides. Um, there's something else we want to talk about today because um, we have so much programming going on at the observatory and this is, we have so much fun doing this. Um, and if you love these kind of programs, we also this past year started a podcast by the one and only Cody Hefman, who is the head of our marketing department um, and also the Astros fan. And she started this with the help of um, educators, John and a whole slew of educators have helped out. And it's been so popular um, that we're gonna do it in a second season. Um, because we're, again, talk, being able to talk to people about this, about astronomy, it's not just science, but there's a lot of cultural stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about movies, yeah. um, not, you know, certainly science, but, but also other things, you know, astronomy in everyday life, science in everyday life. Um, and these are just a blast. And so um, we're, gonna, we're gonna play a, um, a little um, video about season two kind of a, a um, lead up to season two. Incoming transmission. Can you hear us? Are we coming in clear? Can you see us? I don't think they can see us. Why can't they see us? Wait, shouldn't they be able to see us? Yeah, I think they should be able to see us. Oh my gosh, that's so much better. Oh, so that's what you look like. Get ready for star stuff. A space poddy. Season two. Coming in 2023 in glorious video format on YouTube. But don't worry, we'll still be on all of your favorite streaming platforms, including Spotify and iTunes. Follow the little observatory to stay up to date. where we're celebrating the discovery of Pluto here at Lowell Observatory and Flagstaff's role as the home of Pluto. And so Don Johansson, who discovered the fossil hominid Lucy, mm -hmm. um, which is also the namesake of the Lucy mission, yeah. um, in which we have scientists involved, um, he, was, he was part of a panel discussion and, and it, it was just a fascinating discussion. Um, and so we've had so many different really neat topics. So let's take a few minutes for questions here. Um, um, is the moon still volcanically active? Uh, no. That's it? <laughs> it's, it's just not. Um, it, I, I believe it's, it's minorly, um, you get like moon quakes uh, up there. Um, and that's actually how we know a lot about the, the subsurface of the moon is by doing um, geophysical surveys. Uh, when people were up there uh, and using those moon quakes to kind of like see what happens when the seismic quakes. Bless me. Um, <laughs> those little seismic waves. Um, as the seismic waves go beneath the surface, um, we can we can map the subsurface, but it's it's not it's no longer um, geologically active and it's no longer volcanic for sure. And that's that's an interesting thing because um, back in the 1960s and and throughout past decades. Um, there were occasionally people looking at the moon um, that observed what looked like color changes um, and maybe some sort of activity. They were termed transient lunar phenomena. And in fact, in the mid 60s, um, there was a moon mapping program going on at Lowell Observatory. Um, starting in 1961, um, the Aeronautical Charts and Information Center, which is a branch of the Air Force mapping branch, um, they were here at the observatory using the 24 inch refractor. Um, to create these exquisite lunar maps. And John, we've got one over here. Let's hold one of those up. Um, so they were making these exquisitely detailed maps of the lunar surface. And here's one right here. Um, and these were all done by scientists working with artists. Artists uh, would have basic images of the sky and then sketching the details using airbrushes. And if you use these maps, um, compare them to modern views of the moon, they're so accurate. And they made them even um, to have a shadow at a certain angle, the angle that the astronauts would be flying at when they got to the moon. And so this moon mapping was going on in the 60s here at Lowell. And during that time, um, on a couple different nights, some of the observers, Jim Greenacre, um, Ed Barr, they were observing with the Clark and noticed some of these green flashes, green color changes. Um, 
and reported them as some sort of transient lunar, lunar phenomena. And one theory was maybe the moon was erupting, maybe there's some sort of activity, but, um, but it wasn't. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, when you're observing, there's a lot of things you can't explain right away, but then you learn more and understand. So um, let's get some more questions. Um, would, the, would the moon be red on the surface during the eclipse? Um, probably not. Uh, I mean, to, to a very, very small degree. Um, but uh, you wouldn't be able to notice it for the same reason that you uh, shouldn't look at the sun during an eclipse, uh, a solar eclipse. It's because it's sunlight and it'll, it'll burn your burn your <laughs> eyes out. Um, uh, like so, um, the the sunlight coming around would be would kind of blow out any red that you would you would kind of by just trashing your retina. And here's a here's a good question um, that that I think answers a lot of confusion about the moon. Will we ever be able to see the dark side of the moon? And that that's a good introduction to dark side, um, calling it dark side versus the near side and the far side. Mm -hmm. um, the dark side of the moon is, is is called the dark side because it's radio dark. First, um, it's basically uh, so the, the the moon is is tightly locked to us where the same side of it kind of is always going to face us. There's some wiggle room, um, <laughs> but um, as, as the moon gets farther away from us, it will stay, that will stabilize and it'll stop wiggling. It's, that wiggling is partially why it's moving away the energy loss. But um, the back side of the moon, the side, side we can't see, um, is, is the, the dark side of the moon. And it's always facing away from us. So it's, it's radio dark. So when um, the Apollo missions kind of like, when the, when the, uh, the orbiter kind of goes around the moon, um, it's radio dark. They can't, they're not going to hear anything from us. It's not necessarily, I mean, it's not darker or any darker or lighter back there. Um, it's just uh, the mysterious dark side of the moon. Um, and there's something curious about that also, because up until the late 1950s, we had no idea what that side of the moon looked like. Because, you know, if you've looked at the moon, you've probably noticed it. It all looks, it looks the same. And wait a minute, isn't the Earth, you know, the planets spin around and then or and then the moon's orbit, but it turns out where um, the moon is orbiting at the same speed that is spinning on its axis. Um, so we always see the same face. Let's talk about that a little bit, why we see the same face all the time. Well, um, a lot of it has to do, well, so we are, we are tightly locked, um, which means, uh, yeah, it's always facing us, but realistically it's a lot like, um, uh, weeble wobbles. Um, weeble wobbles wobble, but they don't fall down. Um, so the, the moon has an offset, uh, very, very dense core. And that offset dense core is closest to us. You can see it bubbling out in the mar, the dark surface of the moon, um, part of it. Uh, it's not bubbling per se, but yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it bubbled up a long, long time ago and is now frozen. Um, but basically, uh, that offset core is facing us, and so um, as uh, as the moon rotates around us, it's it kind of like early on it wiggle wobble to face us, and now it's kind of stuck in that rotation. But that that is why there is that little bit of wiggle um, as it moves around us as well. And that happened when the moon was formed; it mm -hmm. was just really it was still um, unconsolidated material, but the gravity of Earth. Pulled the denser Sorted materials out. toward it. Yes, yeah, seared it, it through. Froze it in place. Yeah. Um, and the moon was a lot closer back then. So uh, it was a much more pronounced effect. And it's a good time to talk about how the moon was formed, also. Yeah, we got, got sideswiped by a big old rogue planet um, called Theia. It blasted off a bunch of lava um, from the surface of the Earth uh, back in the Hadean time period. Um, Hades, uh, God of the Underworld. Um, uh, also, the uh, equivalent would be Pluto, which we're the home of, so that's cool. Uh, but the Hadean time period, um, it was, Earth was just a ball of, ball of mm, sort of differentiated um, lava flowing all over the surface. And then uh, we get sideswiped, blows these rocks off. Um, we got rings for a while, um, rings of rock. They eventually coalesce into the moon. Um, as they kind of catch up on themselves as they lap each other. And that's something interesting we've we learned from Apollo, 
because before we went to the moon and were able to collect rocks, mm -hmm. there were different theories on how the moon was formed. Yeah. Maybe it was formed at the same time or it was a rogue something that mm -hmm. Earth's gravity pulled it in. Um, but by collecting rocks and be able to look at their chemical signatures, mm -hmm. um, we could determine that they were you know, what you find in the upper crust of the Earth. Yeah. And I know that there's still there's still some argument about the exact size and nature of that body yeah, um, yeah, yeah. that is being debated. But but you know again uh, to me uh, one of the things we learned from Apollo, you know learning how the moon was formed is basic to understanding our solar system and how we got here and in the origins in general. So it's it's good to be able to get to the bottom of those things when we can. Well, with with the moon being a piece of the Earth that came off, you, we can and it is frozen, no longer geologically active. We can learn a lot about the Earth from it, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is fun. Well, here's a question: Are there any cameras on the moon to record the solar eclipse? I think they. I think they. Busted ones. Yeah. They just right. left there. <laughs> I think that I think the best thing probably, I mean, there's still scientific equipment on the moon that's still working and um, detecting moon quakes and such. Um, but I think the closest thing would probably be the moon orbiters. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that they would be looking out, they're looking down. And I don't know, I don't know how their cameras work, but they probably aren't wouldn't be pointed this way. Uh, let's see. How wide is the Earth's shadow by the time it reaches the moon? Um, I feel like it's about the size of the moon. Um, I think I feel like it's pretty close in size, and we're sort of at that. You know, we talked about that like perfect time period right now, where we're in, where they sort of like match up in size, uh, in, in like, like angular spread, like apparent size. Um, and uh, you know, before uh, the moon was a lot closer, and so like during a solar eclipse, it would cover a lot more of the sun. But as the moon leaves, um, that that will that will get smaller and smaller until it'll look more like a transit. Um, and so the same one could be said for Earth's shadow on the moon; that it'll start to cover more and more. The shadow will appear bigger and bigger on the moon. Um, okay, uh, and we. It looks like we're in just a couple of minutes. We're going to take a um, watch another video. This one by Juan Ruiz, um, talking about the surface of the moon. My favorite. Yes. <laughs> well, when you talk about surface, you're talking about geology. Yeah. Uh, and, and the geography, the geography. Um, so there's so many things to talk about. Um, and then after that, we're going to take a, a break. I mean, just to have an eclipse view until 4:20. Um, and so. Um, Juan, uh, just an outstanding educator, one of many outstanding educators here. Um, and so we're going to be excited to hear from him. So let's take a couple more questions before then, and then we'll go to John's video, and then we'll take about 15 minutes um, and just do um, an eclipse view. So let's take one or two more questions. Um, uh, let's see. How would the view be from the International Space Station? Um, so from the International Space Station, they would still see the eclipse, um, the a, a lunar eclipse, just fine. It, I mean, because the moon is a sphere, you know, maybe a little. No, you won't. It'll just look. Like, it'll look basically the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Probably um, a lot clearer. No clouds. <laughs> And that, that, you know, you see um, that the astronauts, they've watched eclipses from the space station before and gotten pictures of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you imagine, I mean, they're not that, that up, they're not that far up there, um, but it's a different view. You don't have the atmosphere to look through. You don't have to worry about clouds and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't think it's about the ice. It's just being like way out there, but it's really close. Yeah, it's not that it's far like up there. really, really close. It's just whipping along. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let's let's uh, play Juan's video about the surface of the moon. And then after that, we'll just go into a break until about 4.20, um, where we can just enjoy um, views of the moon. Hi, how's everyone doing? My name is Juan Alberto Ruiz, and I'm an educator here at Lowell Observatory. And I'm going to talk to you about lunar features today. So the way we have observed the moon has changed drastically throughout human history. 
Whenever you look up and see a full moon with your naked eye, you can clearly see lighter and darker patches across the surface. Cultures from all across the globe have seen things across these contrasting surfaces like a man or a face or even a bunny. But the lighter patches are what we refer to as the lunar highlands. This is where you tend to see the most craters. The crust is the thickest in these areas and tends to be older than the darker patches. The far side of the moon is covered with craters and the areas we also refer to as highlands. The biggest moon's craters can be found on the far side. It is known as the Aiken Basin with a diameter of 2,500 kilometers and a depth of 12 kilometers. The dark patches are known as the mare, and that is Latin for sea because at one point in human history, we actually thought the moon was filled with liquid water. We now know that mare are some flatter, smoother areas on the moon, and it's filled with a lot of basalt. Now, we think that this area on the moon is a lot thinner compared to the crust on the highlands, so we believe that these giant impacts from meteors and comets actually broke through the crust into the mantle, and all that molten rock, the magma, actually erupted towards the surface and completely filled the near side of the moon with magma, which eventually cooled off and left us this flat, darker areas that we refer to as the Maria. These areas are younger than the highlands, and that is why we tend to see less craters. Remember, the moon also does not have a magnetic field or an atmosphere. So, these areas are also younger because we believe that they have not been exposed to the sun as long. So, they are not as sun bleached compared to the highlands. Some of the easiest features to see on the moon are the Tycho, Copernicus, and Kepler craters. You also want to look out for those notable mare, like the Sea of Tranquility, where the Apollo 11 mission landed and others like the Sea of Crisis or the giant ocean storms. The moon also has valleys and mountains very similar to those what we have here on Earth. But the thing is that the moon does not have plate tectonics. We believe that these mountains were formed from these giant impacts that actually lifted up the crust towards the surface and gave us these huge mountain ranges. The most notable mountain range is the Appianus Mountains, where you can find the largest lunar mountain known as Mont Huygens. And this is a giant mountain standing at around 18,000 feet or around 5,500 meters. These mountain ranges can be found separating the Sea of Showers and the Sea of Serenity. The moon even has some weirder features like these lunar swirls that look like paintings all across the surface of the moon. One of them is an anomaly that we refer to as Rainer Gamma. And these are just few of the very prominent lunar features that you can see with your naked eye and through the telescope. Our understanding of these features will only continue to progress as we continue to study our closest companion and one day return to its surface. I want to say thank you to all the members and donors that support Lowell Observatory and make all of this possible.
Well, welcome back. Um, we, we stepped outside to take a look at the moon and we have some clouds going on right now. So Sarah up at the telescope, Sarah Bircher, who's our manages all of our public programs and is fighting the clouds tonight. Um, we're gonna kind of go back and forth between live views and some stored images we have as the clouds permit. So the good thing is we, most of the time we've been able to see the live view up till this point. Um, so we're gonna watch another video right now about Artemis. And Artemis is the um, mission we were talking about earlier, the next crewed mission to the moon. Um, and Gavin Moriarty is gonna talk about Artemis. And it, I'm not sure if we'll talk about the name, but you know, the original mission to the moon was Apollo and Artemis was um, Apollo's sister. Um, and that's important because one of the first goals of Artemis is to send females and people of color to the moon. Um, and then from that, there's gonna be so many more missions and um, moon bases and all that stuff that's being planned. Um, so let's go to Gavin's video right now. Hi, I'm Gavin Moriarty. I'm an educator here at Lowell Observatory. We are just around the corner from the biggest human space exploration in over 50 years. NASA's Artemis mission will be the next step in human space exploration. By 2025, NASA plans to land the first woman and person of color on the surface of the moon. Let's see what we can expect from NASA in the coming years. The Artemis missions are just about to start, and by soon, I mean like this year. At the end of April, NASA just completed their wet dress rehearsal. This is exactly what you think of a dress rehearsal with taking the rocket onto the launch pad and going through all the motions of a real launch, but the wet part of it means that they fueled the rocket. And so they could actually test all the fueling systems before launch as well. And it's a good thing that they did because they did find some problems and they're currently already fixing them. And so we're expecting a launch in August of this year, somewhere around there. So what are these missions actually going to look like? The first one will launch in August of this year. And that'll be an uncrewed mission where the space launch system, the new rocket that NASA is gonna be sending up, will have the Orion capsule on it and they're gonna do an uncrewed mission that will last about a month, just going through the orbits of the Earth and the Moon. And then in 2024, we'll get the first crewed mission. This will be called Artemis II. And this will act the exact same as the uncrewed mission going around Earth and the moon as flybys and will still last about a month. And then the best part, in 2025, we'll have Artemis III. That is gonna be the crewed mission where we will land on the moon for the first time since 1972. On that mission, four people will launch in the Orion capsule and two of them will be chosen to walk on the surface of the moon. They'll spend about six days there doing scientific observations and testing out some systems. And hopefully, if all goes well, we'll get more missions following Artemis III in 2025. That's not the only thing that NASA has planned in the coming future. As well as the Artemis mission, NASA is also planning to build their Lunar Gateway Station which is gonna be an orbiting space station around the moon that will be a checkpoint for future moon missions and for hopeful human deep space travels. And so they're already building pieces for that. We're hoping the first pieces will go up in 2024 and the important pieces with including the human landing system will be there by the time Artemis III reaches the moon in 2025. And then after this, they'll keep adding pieces onto it, more science, propulsion systems, and my personal favorite, the Canada Arm 3. Away from the moon, NASA also has the Psyche missions happening. And so the Psyche is actually an asteroid in the asteroid belt that we think could have actually been the core of an early planet of our solar system. And so the Psyche mission is currently in development by NASA's JPL or Jet Propulsion Labs and is being tested for hopefully launching at the same time as Artemis 1 in August of this year. And so that'll take a couple years to get to the asteroid in question. It'll do a little slingshot around Mars, a little flyby, and then it'll meet up with its asteroid in 2026. And then it'll spend about 20 months or so orbiting around this asteroid and mapping it out, trying to study the properties of it so that hopefully we can understand a little bit more of what actually happened in the early solar system. There are plenty of awesome missions that NASA has in store for us in the future, so keep an eye out to learn more about what is currently happening in the realm of human space exploration. Thank you to our members and donors for making this video possible. 
Well, thanks, Gavin, for that great video. And one thing we should point out um, when Gavin was um, talking about Artemis is that segment was actually filmed in August. Um, that was before the delay in the initial launch. Um, the launch now is set for, I believe it's the 14th. Um, although there's a tropical storm moving toward Florida, um, timed around that time. So I'm not sure how that may or may not affect it. Mm -hmm. um, but Artemis is so exciting. And as we mentioned before, you know, the astronauts came here in the 1960s, uh, but not only that, we had geologists here and engineers developing equipment, um, testing rovers, mm -hmm. um, backpacks they would carry on the moon, um, the, the tools they would use. And that's happening still here in Northern Arizona. Just a couple of weeks ago, um, the desert rats were here. And desert rats, it stands for, um, um, I just forgot. It has something to do with technology and testing equipment. Um, and they were here and um, testing. One of the things they had was a rover. Mm -hmm. that, and I got to write in there, it was pretty cool. Um, and, but, but they're also um, still training the astronauts. The 2017 class has done a lot of training here. And the newest class, I think they're, they're coming out any time. A couple of geologists over at the USGS, um, Jim Skinner and Lauren Edgar um, lead that effort to where they do some classroom training and then take the astronauts to the same places, in some cases, where the Apollo astronauts trained. And so that stuff that happened 50 years ago is, is not just a historic footnote, but the foundation for what's happening today. And I, I think one of the exciting things about Artemis is it's, it's a new generation. You know, kids today, Apollo doesn't mean much, but to see um, people going up there, it's gonna be very inspirational, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, we're explorers at heart. And to be able to see our species go up to another world I think jealousy is one thing that I feel. Yeah, 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 <laughs> Maybe <for sure>. <laughs> so, yeah. So, gosh, we only have, I don't know what happened to the time, but um, we're less than 20 minutes from total the ending. And then um, we'll go back into um, partial eclipse phase. And again, we've been, we've been having some clouds moving in. Luckily, we had, for most of our broadcasts, we were able to see a live view. We've had some, some clouds move in. So Sarah Bircher has, um, I've got some excellent photos um, that are still taken earlier this night of the eclipse. So we're still gonna try to go in and out between live views and views that we got earlier tonight. Um, but we, we actually just have a little bit um, of time left here. Um, I think, gosh, 12 dozen minutes or so we'll talk. And so we'll try to take some more questions for the next dozen minutes and then we'll We'll sign off and just leave everybody with some final views. Uh, but again, um, John Compton, Kevin Schindler, um, we are here live from Lowell Observatory and our behind the scenes crew that's making it all happen, Sarah Bircher, Cody Halfman, Heather Craig and Nate Nice. Um, it's, just, it's just a great team effort. And to be able to share these views and what's happening uh, with people around the world is really exciting for us. That's the core of what we do at the observatory is to communicate science and share that inspiration. And so uh, we're really pleased to be here. We really appreciate our donors and sponsors. Um, we have a, a Friends of Lowell Observatory membership that you can um, sign up and become members and get regular um, updates about science and education that's happening, admissions to the observatory, discounts in the gift shop, admissions to science centers around um, the country. Um, so if you want, to learn more about Lowell or be part of the Lowell team and be a member, I'm um, certainly consider joining the Friends of Lowell Observatory. Um, so John, we've just got a little bit of time left. Just let's, let's take some more questions. Yeah. Here's one that's been um, waiting for a little bit. Uh, let's go back a little bit and talk about the coincidence of when we're talking about the eclipses. Um, one of the reasons they're possible is because the apparent similarity in the size of the moon and sun. So let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, it really is just, it is pure coincidence. Um, it's, it's beautiful, wonderful coincidence, but, um, uh, you know, the moon, the moon is small compared to the earth, but it's still huge, right? It's still a giant chunk of stuff. Um, and it came from the earth and it was a lot closer at some point and it's slowly drifting away. And it is kind of just a wonderful, 
serendipity that it's it happens to be the right size to to um, cover the sun almost perfectly, which means it's gonna um, we'll cast uh, you know that nice shadow over us, and we'll cast a nice shadow over it based on the sizes they are and and the distances they are. But yeah, it is it is just pure coincidence. And it is neat. I mean, we we live in a time when we have a north star that's pretty darn close to true north, close enough to be accurate. Go back in time, and there's not a really good brightest star in that direction. We just happen to live at a time because the Earth is spinning on its axis once every 26,000 years. Right now, we just happen to be pointing real close to Polaris, which is the 51st brightest star in the night sky. Um, but the same thing with, with the size of um, the sun and the moon, that the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, but it's 400 times further away. So they appear to be the same size. Um, what that means is in 50 million years or so, as the moon keeps getting further and further away, it'll never be, it won't be big enough. We won't have total solar eclipses anymore. Mm -hmm. We'll have annual eclipses for a while. Yeah. Um, but it, it's just amazing. We just happen to live in this time yeah. um, right now. We'll call it the lunar transit eventually. We'll call it the John Compton transit. Let's uh, scroll through some more um, things. And again, we'll, we'll continue trying to get live views as we can. If not, we'll, we'll show um, images we took earlier in the night. Um, uh, speaking on the, I guess while we're looking for more fun questions, um, the, uh, when the moon was a lot larger in our view, um, some people believe that uh, the, during a solar eclipse, that's where we get the, um, like the eye of Ra, like symbol, uh, symbolism, like the, specifically the um, lines coming off. Uh, is part of um, what the what the uh, solar eclipse would have looked like um, back in the day, um, based on like uh, diffraction, because you're not going to get that, that perfect view. It's going to cover it up, and you're going to get these lines coming off. But just super neat. And we we have just gosh, just nine minutes of totality left. The last totality of the moon we'll have until 2025. So enjoy it while we can. Um, Another question we have is what, what is Artemis three? Well, Artemis one is is the one that hopefully is is going to launch on the fourteenth, and that's an uncrewed mission. If all goes well, and I think the timetable still holds in twenty twenty four, Artemis two with people on it will fly to the moon and orbit around it. And if all goes well, um, Artemis three the following year in twenty twenty five is when humans will again step foot on the moon, returning. Um, for the first time in 50 years, or I guess more than that, 54 years by then, or whatever it will be. I will not be one of those people, unless it's get in the comments. <laughs> All right, let's scroll through here. Um, uh, oops. And there's so, let's see here. John, maybe you can, while I'm looking through our comments here, maybe you can kind of recap uh, what we've seen tonight, um, the eclipse and why we're seeing it. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, we're, we're basically seeing the Earth making, making shadows on the, the moon, right? So the sun um, is shining bright as ever, um, beautiful soul, uh, shining light, and uh, the Earth is sort of passing in, in, or the, the moon is sort of like passing into the shadow of the earth. And um, it's, uh, earth is literally throwing shade on the moon. Um, it's where we get a lot of the terminology. So um, penumbral um, and uh, the umbral uh, and the, the, the um, totality phases like, so um, umbral like umbrella means shade, right? Or shadow. Um, and so uh, we're, we're getting um, as, as, you know, you've got, you imagine a blank spotlight of shadow, whatever you call that, um, out in space, and the moon is slowly passing through it. Um, and when it's in totality, it's, it's sort of completely in that um, shadow, spot shadow, uh, but <clears throat> um, it's going to start passing back out um, into the umbral and, and penumbral phases, um, and then be on its merry way for the next 
three years or whatever. Okay. And we've got another question asking about, we mentioned before about an event we're doing in 2024. Mm -hmm. That's the solar eclipse. And that's um, Eclipse Over Waco Live 2024. Um, that, that's going to be total solar eclipses aren't nearly as common. Yeah. And we had one, you know, you think, oh, we just had one a few years ago in 2017, where it's dressed across a big swath of the United, the continental United States. Mm -hmm. And the one in 2024 is going to is going to come up from Mexico um, through Texas, kind of stretching to the northeast. It'll go through my hometown in Ohio, mm -hmm. although April in Ohio isn't a good time yeah. to look at the skies. Um, but yeah, it could be could work out up into New York and beyond. And so that's going to be another so-called great American eclipse. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be, you know, for most of us, unless you chase eclipses around the world, that's going to be our last practical time um, to see a good um, solar eclipse, uh, total solar eclipse. So, so um, Low Observatory is doing an event in Waco in partnership with the city of Waco and Baylor University, it's gonna be centered right around football stadium, both inside and outside. So, you know, our people tailgate for football parties, football games will be tailgating as it were with telescopes and all sorts of great activities. And Discovery mm -hmm. is going to be um, broadcasting that around the world. And so that's gonna, that's that's where the 2024 event is gonna be. Um, so, and we're excited about that. So we, we're, <clears throat> let's see, 4.37, we're just uh, four minutes from totality ending. And in fact, we're gonna, when totality ends, we're gonna sign off and hopefully uh, we'll still be able to give you some live views. We're I'm trying to get as many live views as we can because the clouds were going back and forth between that and um, some views that Sarah Bircher got early in the night. Um, so John, let's, I think just take this last few minutes to, um, thank everybody who's watching, and um, we've got a couple more questions um, yeah, we've got time to, more. to take here, and then we'll we'll sign off in a few minutes. Um, another question we've got that just came in: How long will the moon take to get from totality back to normal? And um, the so totality ends at 4:41, and then at 6:56 is when is when the partial ends. And that's, that's the umbral partial. The penumbral, as John was talking about, you can't really tell. I mean, there's a shadow, but you can't really see it. So when we think of the eclipse, well, we'll see it ends at 656. And for a lot of people, you're in daylight. You'll be in daylight, so you won't, um, you might not see it, or it won't be obvious. Um, so, um, yeah. Let's see, do we have any other? So the so the umbral eclipse actually ends earlier than that. Uh, the penumbral is six fifty six, so it'll be before that that <clears throat> um, that it'll be ending. It'll be like, like nothing ever happened. Yeah, it'll yeah it'll be back to normal. And it, you know the lunar eclipses are they're fun because they're kind of eerie, it, especially if it's partly cloudy or clear. You know when you get that reddish moon, mm -hmm. and that's why some people call it the blood red moon. Um, and and in culture, sometimes that's that's been some portent of doom. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a great story from history, Christopher Columbus, when he was on one of his trips to Jamaica, um, he had lunar tables, he had astronomy tables, and knew that a, a total lunar eclipse was coming. And there was some fighting going on among the people there. And so to try to calm them down, he said, if you don't settle down, I'm gonna take the moon away from you at this time, and and he did, and and the moon started getting dark, and then it went, you know, it eclipsed, and that got by everybody's attention, and you know, essentially, okay, we'll be good, okay, I'll bring the moon back, turn this moon around, yes. and so okay. he used that used that knowledge to to, um, so you know that's kind of an interesting tale, um, so. Um, it's been great to, to have this feed tonight and to be able to view live from the observatory. Um, Sarah Bircher has been just doing an incredible job with the telescope. It's, it's always a challenge when you're doing astronomy and there's clouds because we want to show the best we can. Luckily, we had such a clear night, a clear sky earlier on that um, she was able to get all sorts of images early. 
And so the latest ones we've been having are kind of a mix of, of live images and some recorded earlier tonight. Um, so thanks, Sarah, for doing all that. Um, Nate, Cody, and Heather keeping us going behind the scenes um, because there's several different systems working here and communication is critical. And, and we certainly thank our viewers for watching because this is, again, this gets at the core of who we are at the Observatory, communicating science and sharing the inspiration of the cosmos. Um, and so that it's been really great in our, in our supporters and donors who um, watch these programs with us. And for all the, those of you who wrote in questions and comments, uh, we got a lot of great comments, some that we didn't put in, um, we didn't say, they, they were on the YouTube feed, but um, besides questions, there were a lot of fun comments about people's experience and where they're viewing from and such. Yeah, yeah. appreciate y'all for being part of it. Well, thanks so much for joining us, John. It's been great again. Yeah. And uh, suddenly the eclipse is over. It's ending right now. Um, so we'll sign off and um, leave you with some final um, views of tonight's eclipse. Um, enjoy. Thank you. Bye, nerds. Mm -hmm.